I have done my research and I've come to the conclusion that I will be dating Sydney Sweeney before college football turns to a Super League. I'm going to tell you why one of those things is going to happen. This is Locked on Baylor. You are Locked on Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to another episode of Locked on Baylor. Happy April 5th to all my Baylor fans out there who are celebrating today. I am your host, Cam Stewart from ESPN Central Texas. Uh, we have a lot to get into, including a, an update on this on this Super League chaos and you know getting some time to let it breathe a little bit. This is not going to happen. And I saw an interesting uh, graphic out there in the socials about the Mount Rushmore of current active college football or college football, college basketball coaches. Does Scott Drew make the list? It's it's not as easy as I once thought. And speaking of Scott Drew, there is another assistant coach leaving Waco. We'll talk about uh, who that is and where he's going potentially. And of course, I already kind of alluded to it a little bit, but it is April 5th. We will talk about the greatness that happened three years ago on this day, which of course also relates to Scott Drew. So a little basketball heavy episode, but we start it with football. I was in a tizzy on yesterday's show, trying to trying to digest all that came out in that athletic story about the proposed Super League and CTS and, and what's going to happen with all of this. Um, and I haven't even gotten to the NIL portion of it yet. And I can tell you unequivocally, this will not happen. Under the structure that was given in that athletic article, this will not happen. And for it to happen at all, it is going to take a few years. Like this is not like we're talking about 2030s, I'm thinking. Uh, so you you have some more years to deal with whatever the NCAA is right now in terms of college football. I think there are some, I think there are some decent proposals within this super league proposal. I, I don't mind the idea of like seven, 10 team divisions and, and running it with, with tiebreakers and record. Of course I love, um, I, I love that idea there's there's some amount of unfairness there, but there's some amount of unfairness in the NFL that we don't really complain about when it comes to playoff seeding and that playoff structure. I don't mind that at all. Uh, but with each one of those things that I think are positive coming out of that proposal, there's another thing that doesn't make sense. You remember in yesterday's show, I was talking about how there were seven divisions, but according to the playoff structure, there were eight division winners. That is because the eighth division is the 10 teams that would earn promotion from that second tier, the, the rest of the FBS outside of the Power Five or former Power Five conferences. So that means you would have a division completely made up of teams that were outside of the Power Five and therefore outside of the top tier the year before, which would also mean probably only one of those teams would make the 16 team playoff. And there's nothing that would show that they're really ready for this. And I know that's kind of where we're at right now, but you're talking about 10 teams. I guess you're taking the best group of five teams and putting them all in the same division. Um, I don't know if that's the solution either. I think if you're a college football fan outside of the Big Ten and the SEC, you're not necessarily worried about having all these great group of five teams in a playoff scenario so much as you were worried about not having it all be Big Ten and SEC, which in this proposal, we could still see 14 or 15 teams from what those two conferences would have been just playing in different divisions now. So we did find an eighth division in there, but now the numbers don't add up because then you're talking about 80 teams rather than 70 teams because the group of the 70 cannot be relegated. And how is that fair? And, you know, you could see someone like a Boise State, you know, the run they had 10, 15 years ago, and they they don't have a permanent spot in college football's top tier, but Illinois and Rutgers do. You know, it's, that just seems silly. 
And of course, this whole thing is silly. And I think one of the big things that cannot be ignored is the TV deal. College football is controlled by the TV deal, the art of the TV deal, right? We That's no surprise to anyone. And what also won't come as a surprise is you can't really just wriggle your way out of this six or seven or eight years early. These TV deals are running through 2030, 2031, 2032. Like that's not something that even some of the most powerful people in in sports can change within a year or two. Like that's that's not going to happen. And I think one of the other big things from this athletic article is just talking about who's not on board yet. I talked about this a little bit in yesterday's show but didn't really get into it in that, you know, there, there are a couple of really important people that are not on board. Um, the ACC board of directors heard a presentation from the group in February. Okay. So they've heard them out, but the, this is directly from the athletic article, by the way, but the planned dinners with administrators from the big 10, the SEC and the big 12 were all called off. Spokespersons for the Big Ten and the SEC said commissioners Petiti and Greg Sankey, respectively, have not met with Perna's group, which is CST, the ones that are proposing this Super League. We're kind of done right there. That's that's kind of full stop, right? I mean, college football is controlled by the networks, the SEC, and the Big Ten. And right now, None of those people are on board. None of them have even heard it to the fact that to the point where we are canceling dinners. Uh, you know, even 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 Brett Yormark is in on that text chain, like, ah, guys, I'm not gonna be able to make it either. Sorry. Greg Sankey's like, ah, yeah, something came up. You know, my kids' little league game got moved. Ah, sorry, can't go to the dinner with you guys. Full stop. Like, we're kind of done right there. Is the Super League something that can happen years and years in the future? Sure. Sure. And it probably does give a better structure in terms of NIL. I mean, the the, the weird kind of solution, I think, to this NIL Wild West problem is just going to be having schools paying players directly, which we're getting closer and closer to every day. So I, I think there's a... There's a good thought behind that. There's a good thought behind the playoff structure. Um, but this just has too many hurdles. Uh, there's just no way. And when you're talking about not having, you, you know, you've got the the Syracuse president and the West Virginia president on record talking about how great this deal would be and, and part of one of the spearheads of these proposals. That's all well and good. But we are under no illusion just because they are behind it, but the Big Ten, the SEC, and the Big 12 are not, that is a very tipped power scale. You know, even, even if uh, uh, President Linda Livingstone for Baylor comes out and says, yeah, we're really on board with it, that doesn't move the needle. If TCU's president comes out and says it, that doesn't move the needle. If Stanford's president comes out and says it, that doesn't move the needle. You have to have Petiti and Sankey and most likely, if you're going to have presidents of universities, it's going to need to be Ohio State, Michigan, Alabama, USC, maybe Notre Dame. Like that, that's who we need to hear from. But until then, this Super League is, is totally dead before it's even born. Um, again, some good ideas to take out of it that I hope the NCAA will think about adopting. But this Super League, it ain't happening. Something that is happening is our new sponsor, Robinhood Confidential. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap 
on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. And this offer is good through April 30th, like I said. So get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscriptions fees to apply. And now, of course, for the legal info. The claim as of quarter one, 2024, validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of the first 3% match. You must keep Robinhood IRA for five years, and the 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC, member SIPC, is a registered broker dealer. Thank you to Robinhood for sponsoring today's Locked on Baylor. And news if you can call it that, from the field of 68, you know, their college basketball media entity run by Jeff Goodman, among other people. So maybe you're like me and you've muted Jeff Goodman. But I saw this tweet from from Stadium, or excuse me, I saw this tweet from Field of 68 yesterday. And it is, who is their current Mount Rushmore active head coaches in 2024? Who is their Mount Rushmore? They put out Bill Self of Kansas, Kelvin Sampson of Houston, uh, Dan Hurley of UConn, and Baylor Scott Drew. Those are your four current. And I saw this, and my initial thought was, yeah, sure. Okay. That makes sense. And I thought about it a little bit. And I'm thinking, man, there are, there are some great names left off that list. And I'm trying to kind of go with their criteria for it. So I decided to make my own criteria. And what I want to look at in terms of the best active head coaches in 2024, not, not 2012, not 1996, 2024. I, I would love to see, first, I would need to see a Hall of Fame resume, really, if you're going to be in the top four, a Hall of Fame resume, um, consistency, winning in March, and consistency winning in March, right? Those are the things. If you can develop NBA talent, that's terrific too. But in terms of this Mount Rushmore, I don't really care about that. I don't. So, you know, that might that might help or hurt some people. So first I'm looking at who did not make the list. Mark Few. A couple final fours under his belt. Gonzaga's made the Sweet 16, whatever it is now. Six straight years, is that it? Seven, something? Something crazy. Uh, nine. They make the Sweet 16 every year, which us as Baylor fans can really appreciate how tough that is to do. But of course, Mark Few's fingers are like mine. They're ringless. Doesn't have a national championship. I think he's been to, what, four Final Fours, but doesn't have that national championship. Okay, so you leave him off the list. I think that's a tough draw uh, because he fits the consistency category better than... Maybe any coach in college basketball right now consistently winning and consistently winning in March but has not gotten that elusive national championship ring, which I think will come for him before he retires. Unless he's pulling a Jay Wright and he's going to hang him up next year, I think that that is coming for him. And then the next three that I thought about on here are three Hall of Famers that don't make the list. Okay? Tom Izzo was the first one I thought of. He's been at it forever. He's got a national championship ring, and he has gone to eight, eight Final Fours. His teams always play the he's the the prototypical like cliche. You know, get the tough schedule early, make people doubt you, and then go and win in March. Uh, he's been terrific at that for a long time. And he's one of those who, if I did do NBA products, he's not at the top of the list, but he he keeps guys there for years. He has had some terrific All-American players. And through that, he's had some Final Four teams that have not had terrific All-American players. How about Rick Pitino? You know, he's someone people forget about because he's coaching at St. John's now. But, I mean, he has coached at some of the top programs in America and one at the very highest level. He's got two national titles, 
one, depending on what record books you look at, but two national titles that he went out there and won and seven final fours. And he has done that with two different teams, which is, again, something that is very rare in college basketball. It's rare to have a career like Tom Izzo where you're doing it only with one team. And Patino's done it with two in two distinctly different eras. He has taken Kentucky to a couple Final Fours, won a national championship with them in 96, and then took Louisville to -to back-to-back Final Fours in 2012 and 13, the latter of which he won the national championship. Again, depending on what record book you look at. Uh, And, you know, almost had another notch on his belt. He took took Iona to the NCAA tournament and very nearly maybe should have had St. John's in the NCAA tournament right now. But one thing that I do need to take into account on this is sanctions and cheating, potentially. Uh, Tom Izzo doesn't really have that on his resume. Rick Pitino does. He's had to vacate a national championship and two final fours at Louisville. And right now is like, as we speak, being investigated once again uh, for tampering and talking to players who weren't yet in the transfer portal in his time at St. John's. So that is something you need to take into account when it comes to these guys. Uh, when you look at the the four that the field of 68 had, two of those guys have had, had major investigations. Uh, Kelvin Sampson, when he was at uh, when he was at OU, forced him out of OU. Uh, that is something that we look at now, and it's like, well, every coach does that now. It's encouraged um, with the way you know he was talking to players and trying to get transfers and things like that. The other, of course, is Bill Self, which, look, there are a lot of skeletons in that closet. He's certainly, I mean, he's had assistants and and partners go to jail. Um, There is a lot of smoke around that fire, that, that around Bill Self. Whether we ever feel the full effect of that fire, don't know, but there's plenty of smoke around there. Third one that didn't make the list that I want to mention, because the cheating thing definitely comes into account here, John Calipari, he doesn't hit the consistency measure right now the last almost 10 years, really. It's been 10 years since he's made a Final Four, right? Nine years since he's made a Final Four. So you don't have that consistency aspect right now, but he has something that most college coaches ever don't have. He has taken not one team to a Final Four, not two teams to a Final Four, but three different teams to a final four, three very different programs. And he has taken these programs from the relative ashes. You know, I mean, the ashes at UMass are a lot different from the ashes at Kentucky and taken them to final four national title game. And in one case, a national championship. Um, I don't think we can undersell this or understate this enough. Uh, Let me start. Try that again. I don't think we can overstate this enough. John Calipari, as a 36-year-old, took UMass to the Final Four. The University of Massachusetts, the UMass Minutemen, to the Final Four. Where he lost to Rick Pitino in Kentucky, by the way. That is arguably a greater accomplishment than anyone I've listed outside of Scott Drew winning a national championship. To take UMass to the Final Four. That one gets vacated. Took Memphis to the national championship game. Resurrected that program. Derrick Rose, Chris Douglas Roberts. That one's vacated. Kentucky was in a mess when Calipari came. And what, three, four years into that thing, he had them winning a national championship, which has not yet been vacated. Um, That, to me, is one of the most impressive resumes in college basketball history. And I know he's memed now and people don't like him. a lot of fan bases don't like him, of course. Um, and the he's been a first weekend exit guy the last five or six years. But outside of that one consistency criterion that I have there, he's got to be on that Mount Rushmore. And if we're talking about consistency, Dan Hurley is in his second straight final four. Um, so I think... I would have Calipari over Dan Hurley on that Mount Rushmore still. But that would probably change by next Tuesday when Dan Hurley and UConn win another national championship. Then it becomes tough to argue. 
I, you know, all three of these guys are in the Hall of Fame. By the way, Rick Pitino in the Italian American Sports Hall of Fame, worth mentioning. Uh, but the other two is Owen Calipari or not. Um, I, I think. I think Calipari deserves a spot on that list, on that current Mount Rushmore. And it's tough for me to have a guy like Kelvin Sampson, who has not won a national championship, to justify that, but not having Mark Few, a guy who has also not won a national championship. Because I think you're splitting hairs at who is the better coach. And in terms of consistency, Mark Few has had a more consistent run over 10 or 15 years, but the last five or six, those, those two programs have been neck and neck. Gonzaga and Houston. And honestly, if you look at the consistency in the winning in March, Scott Drew might be lucky to be on there. I mean, what he's done, the most impressive thing of, of all those seven or eight coaches, eight coaches that I listed, he has the most impressive of building Baylor up from where it was into winning a national championship. But the consistency in winning in March has not been there. I mean, it's been one won Elite Eight in 10 years now. And, you know, you, you you talk about the one Final Four, and that's a fantastic team, but I'm seeing Patino did it, did it seven times. Izzo did it eight times. Calipari did it six times. And I know a lot of those programs are different than what Baylor's had to deal with. I know that. But even looking at someone like Calipari, UMass, that's no cakewalk to take to the Final Four. And Memphis at the time was no cakewalk to get to the final four. And he had them at 33 and one in the national championship game. So I think Scott drew does deserve a spot on this Mount Rushmore, but it's, it's closer than you might think. And I don't know if I can have Kelvin Sampson or, or Dan Hurley on there just yet, even though they're guys I respect the crap out of when you look at the resumes of these other hall of famers that are still, still coaching in our game right now. Today's episode of Locked On Baylor is also brought to you by Game Time. It is the best place to go and buy tickets. If you're like me and you're trying to hit all 30 MLB ballparks, now is the time. The weather is nice. Baseball is back. It is time to get out there and see how crappy the Fanatics jerseys are in person. And you do that through Game Time, okay? Because they're doing flash deals throughout the week where you can get the best deals on, on your zone and your part of the arena. You can see all the pictures of where you're going to sit before buying the ticket and also no hidden fees in there. You have an all-in pricing to see what you are going to pay. And the best part about it, too, is you can if you find somewhere that's not game time that you can find a better deal in the same row in the same section that you could find on game time, guess what? They'll make it up to you. Game time will credit you 110% of the difference. That is the lowest price guarantee, okay? So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account and use the code locked on college for $20 off your first purchase, okay? So that's for games, concerts. I I'm, I use Game Time for a comedy show that I'm going to in a couple of weeks. It's it's for all of those things, okay? So terms do apply. Again, create an account, redeem the code locked on college, that's L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. And some tough news out of the Baylor basketball coaching staff once again for the second time in about a week here. Uh one of Scott Drew's top and most trusted assistants is is leaving the program. Bill Peterson uh, announced on Twitter yesterday that he will be moving on, that he is going for the next challenge after seven strong seasons, or I guess, yeah, seven strong seasons in Waco. He actually joined the same time that John Jacobs did after the 2017 season. And Bill Peterson is one of those guys, much like Jacobs was for a while, much like Alvin Brooks and Ty Beard have been, uh, depending on how diehard a fan you are. They're one of those guys that are behind the scenes, they're not Scott Drew, uh, but they're making a huge impact on this program. And I said this a bunch about Jacus, and the same goes for Peterson. It is not a coincidence that these guys, and you know, Alvin Brooks getting promotions and things like that, it's not a coincidence that these guys come in around the same time and a couple years later, they're cutting down the nets and winning national championships. Like these guys had so much to do with the development of 
of this program and taking it to heights that it had never seen and had never thought possible, I suppose is the, is the way to look at it. But Bill Peterson has announced that he is moving on. Um, he is a basketball guy. I mean, he is, he has been everywhere. He actually came to Baylor from the G league. He was head coach of the G league for a couple of years. Um, he was an assistant with the bucks for, for years. Uh, he was part of the player personnel staff with the Mavericks years and years ago um, when they were drafting like Steve Nash and Dirk Nowitzki, like those, those kinds of Mavericks uh, and, and developing their skills. Uh, he also has been at, at Alabama Huntsville. He was a head coach there. So he's, he's coached in college. He's coached in the NBA. He's coached in the minor leagues. And he will have, obviously, uh, uh, no no issue finding finding another job. So uh, and, a, and a real nice guy to, to boot, too. Uh, we've had him on the Matt Mosley Show on ESPN Central Texas, which I am on every day, three to five. Uh, we've had him on a few times. Super nice guy and, and not very willing to not pull punches in terms of telling things like it is. And um, so that, that is, a, that is a hurt for Baylor staff. Um, it, it's one of those things. I, I don't worry about Baylor and the stability of their program, but I think it is okay to kind of be skeptical for this season, not having Jacus and Bill Peterson on the bench there and having to bring in two new guys like, or, or promoting some other guys and, bringing bringing in new people on the back end um it is something that i don't want to call it even a cause for concern but it it might hinder that the team a little bit to just have that much turnover so wishing all the best to bill peterson who had a huge hand in what we celebrate the three-year anniversary of yes today april 5th the three-year anniversary of baylor basketball's national championship victory over Gonzaga in Indianapolis, 86 to 70. Anybody, probably anybody watching this and most Baylor fans can tell you exactly where they were on that night. I was in McLean Stadium. I got to watch it with um, some of my best college friends and it was truly a once in a lifetime experience. Uh, I really wish I was in Indianapolis, but being in Waco was the, was the second best place for it. Um, and the, I think the further we get away from that championship team, the more we can appreciate it and appreciate what that moment meant for the university, uh, for the basketball program, and and for a lot of us, the fans, who who didn't think this would ever happen. And I, I can't lie, man. I, I didn't think they were ever going to do it. Baylor football, Baylor men's basketball, I, I thought they were never going to win a national championship. And we could have a great time still, you know, maybe making a, a crazy final four run at one point, but, you know, having a good steady program that made the tournament a lot. Um, and then they made that switch to elite and very, in very short order from when that switch, that flip switch got flipped. <laughs> we saw them do the unthinkable and especially to do it over that Gonzaga team. Um, you know, it would probably make, it would probably be better in the history books to do it over Duke or North Carolina or Kentucky. Uh, but you talk about a Gonzaga team that was 31 and zero, like nobody thought they could be beaten. Uh, and nobody picked Baylor in that game. Nobody, even though Baylor was so strong that whole year. Um, so I think because of that, a lot of people who aren't fans of Baylor aren't really tuned into college basketball you know, just saw this as a big upset and didn't realize how dominant Baylor was. And I think it's important to look back on not just that night, but that team, that whatever, 28-2 and two team that just rolled through everybody. And if, and if COVID had not infiltrated their locker room, we could have been talking about them as the undefeated team. Like 28-2 and two on the year. One of those losses comes after what, 17 days off away from the facility um, when they lost to Kansas, and then they lose to Oklahoma State in the Big 12 tournament, which came after a second COVID infiltration into the program, where, again, they were just kind of, uh, you know, not with each other and not practicing. Uh, but just an unbelievable team just rolled through the Big 12 at, at I think, it, whatever it was, 13-1 and one or 15-1, and one, whatever that was and and never dropped below I think fifth the whole year. Um, all their 
All their games, they won by eight or more points, which is just an incredible stat to look at for an entire college basketball season, especially the Big 12 and, and running through the NCAA tournament. But specifically that Gonzaga game, it's just, you almost had to be there. Like, we put the nation on notice, like, right from the jump. Right from the jump, Gonzaga had no idea what hit them. Uh, it was, what, 9 nothing or 11 nothing right out of the gate. Uh, I remember thinking, watching this game, and thinking, like, Corey Kispert was a first-team All-American. And you watch that game, and you're like, he wouldn't even start for Baylor. <laughs> Like he was a total non-factor. Uh, Suggs got his points. Timmy was shut down big time. Um, he is the most 20-plus point games in the history of the NCAA tournament. I think he had 12 in that game against Baylor. Uh, the Zags were held 21 points under their season average. This team averaged, averaged 91 points a game. And Baylor held them to 70, the lowest total they had the whole year. That is mind-boggling. Not only did we beat what people were calling one of the best college basketball teams of all time, they destroyed them. They made them look like an average college basketball team. And we were touting this as one of the very best, maybe the best to ever play the game. Maybe the best offensive college basketball team ever outside of maybe a Loyola Marymount. They held them to 70 points. And they needed garbage time to get there. That, that's incredible. It's incredible, man. And this Baylor defense, which Ken Palm, you know, didn't love statistically. They were, I think, 27th by the end um, of, of the run, like 44th going into the tournament. And they were still, I mean, they were turning teams over like one on every four or five possessions. They were absolute ball hawks. Um, an incredible, incredible team. And the final four, they were plus 35. I had to like sit back in amazement at how UConn could go plus 55 in the Sweet 16 and Elite Eight, uh, you know, just last weekend. And that is incredible. I'm not taking away from that. But then I thought Baylor took it a round further and was plus 35. Like they got to the final four and it got easier. No one could touch them. That team is. Forever, forever untouchable. Forever engraved in our minds. Um, to that starting five, it, all icons, all legends. Davion Mitchell, Jared Butler, Macy Oteague, Mark Vidal, Flo Thamba. And then you've got Jonathan Chum with Chachua. You've got Adam Flagler. You've got a guy who plays at Houston. Uh, like, that was an unbelievable... Matthew Meyer? Can't even forget Matthew Meyer time. Like, that team, top to bottom unbelievable and just all Baylor legends Mark Patterson scoring in the final four. Oh man I, I got emotional on the night I I get emotional thinking about it uh just how special that team was and is um for for all of us Baylor fans um and that special parade that came afterwards um that will never be touched you know and if need be, we could suck on that nipple forever. I think Baylor has the the coach and the resources and the commitment to get back there and do it again. I, I truly do think that even after what we've seen over the last couple of years. But those kinds of things, sometimes they're once in a lifetime. And that team is once in a lifetime. And I will never forget where I was that night and how how grateful I am for that team for what they did for the university and for us as, as Baylor fans. I mean, truly not to get too corny, but like gave us a chance to believe in something sports wise, you know, that you can be at the very bottom and get to the very top. They prove that. Let me know what you think, what you remember from that night. Please, please do drop that down in the comments below. Let me know what you think about this, this uh, Super League chaos and whether this will ever get off the ground. Drop that in the comments too. And whether you have Scott Drew on your current Mount Rushmore. I'm not going to lie. It was tight for me after all I just said about that 2021 team. Uh, that's that's why it's a Mount Rushmore though. It's the top four, right? Uh, drop that down in the comments below as well. Thank you for making it your first listen today and every day. Be sure to like and subscribe. We'll be back on Monday 
with another episode of your favorite show, which is, of course, Locked On Baylor.